Here we go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I am so excited to be joined by three of my favorite people, Megan Abbott, Jeff Abbott, and Ace Atkins. Um, I'm McKenna. I'm the owner at Murder by the Book, and I am just going to introduce everyone and turn it over to uh, Megan today. So here are their, their bios. I hope I've got them right. <clears throat> Ace Atkins is the author of 23 books, including now 10 Quinn Colson novels the first two of which, The Ranger and The Lost Ones, were nominated for the Edgar Award for Best Novel. And he has a third Edgar nomination for his short story, Last Fair Deal, Gone Down. He's the author of seven New York Times bestselling novels and the continuation of Robert B. Parker's Spencer series. Before turning to fiction, he was a correspondent for the St. Petersburg Times and a crime reporter for the Tampa Tribune, and he played defensive end for Auburn University football. Jeff Abbott is the New York Times bestselling author of 20 novels. He is the winner of an International Thriller Writers Award for the Sam Capra thriller, The Last Minute, and is a three-time nominee for the Edgar Award. He lives in Austin with his family. And Megan Abbott is the award-winning author of 10 novels, including You Will Know Me, The Fever, Dare Me, and The End of Everything. She received her PhD in literature from New York University. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times Magazine, The Guardian, and The Believer. She lives in New York City. So um, they're here today to talk about the latest releases by Ace Atkins, um, uh, The Revelators, and Jeff Abbott, um, <laughs> Never <laughs> Ask Me. Um, also, Megan, her latest release is Give Me Your Hand, and I am eagerly anticipating when we get another book from her. If you are interested in ordering books from Murder by the Book, um, Jeff will be getting us book plates within a couple days, and we have signed book plates and very cool Quinn Colson for Sheriff um, stickers from Ace that will go along with your purchase. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments, and we'll get to them later. Um, but without any further ado, here is Megan Abbott. Okay. Oh, this is exciting. Uh, before we start, I just want to urge... Uh, anyone watching who just hopefully decides to buy one or both of these books that you should order them through Murder by the Book. Um, it, our indies are, you know, more important than ever. Don't go download on your Kindle, please. But buy the book from Murder by the Book. It means so much. And I know it means so much to Jeff and Ace if, if you would do so. So please do that. And you are in for two rides. Um, uh, so I want to start with Jeff because he is my husband and my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get that on video now for posterity. Um, uh, and I'll ask you a few questions and then East and then we'll, we'll open the floor. But uh, oh my gosh, uh, this was a truly, truly a white knuckle ride for me. And uh, I want to ask, a, you know, a, a few questions that sort of dances around. It's very hard to avoid spoilers because it is a real there are many twists in it and it really unfolds so masterfully. But I, I thought, you know, writer to writer, one of the things that was so interesting is how you start. This is sort of a, this lush suburb um, outside of Austin, a lake haven. And it starts, you know, it could not be a more gentle scene. It's two teenagers, the early morning, they're playing like this Pokemon like app game. And they sort of stroll into this park and, you know, it's sort of like the beginning of Blue Velvet. What could be more idyllic? And, and then they come upon uh, the mother of one of the teens who's, it's, uh, this is not a spoiler because it's in the first chapter, um, sit, uh, sitting dead on a park bench. So it's just like, boom, out of the gate. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what, what you came to that as the beginning and, and, your, and your sort of strategy there. Well, uh, in fact, well, thank you for all the kind words. Um, even though we are related, um, I appreciate that. That's a joke, people. We get this, and so we've turned it into a joke. Um, no, I I wanted to start in with sort of the feel of a quiet neighborhood because sort of the whole theme of Never Ask Me is the secrets that people have. And the one question that maybe someone doesn't want to be asked. And I feel like every character in this book has a question that they really could not bear to, to be asked. Um, <laughs> playing the digital game came from watching my teenagers playing the digital game, which I swore I wouldn't get into. And then they put it on my phone and I would go for walks um, after our house burned down and we were living in a rental house. And 
it was just sometimes you just had to get out of it not to be de- and I would go for walks and I would play the game while I was going for walks and I guess that just stuck in my mind as something I could borrow and I could put in there but I also wanted it to be the shock that it was the mother of one of them that that they found that he he didn't find her at home murdered he went out into the world and found her there even though it was it was just the park down the street from them and I kind of wanted it to be a shock but I also think about, you know, how do we find things that are our own voice? I think of you and Ace as writers that really have such strong individual voices. And someone had said to me a couple of years ago, they said, I think you're the only author who has won both an Agatha and a thriller. And I thought, am I? And then I thought, I am. I'm like, why can't I bring those two things together? Can that be part of my voice? Um, to have won a thriller award, which usually go to these very psychological or high octane kind of novels, which those are the kinds of things I enjoy writing or the traditional mystery, which is where I got my start. And I still love to read them and I may write another one at some point. So I think it was sort of like two big influences in my work kind of coming together. And you know, that makes so much sense. And you do um, a little bit of a sleight of hand with that too, because it, it starts um, in many ways, like what we now call, I guess, for lack of a better term, a domestic thriller, right? It's about, right. you know, regular people, generally even suburban and uh, families, and then something sort of breaks apart. But then it, it, it sort of switches genres a little bit. And I'm not going to say what genre and when, because uh, that would be a spoiler. Uh, but then I think it comes back around and that felt like quite a dance because you you think you're, you know, you think you sort of have the basic understanding of the sort of set of things that could have gone wrong here. And then they suddenly become much, uh, the terrain becomes much larger. And was that always a plan, the plan? Well, I'm loving that you said I'm good at sleight of hand because there was a review that said I was a stage magician. And I think the two of you know, I am the physically most clumsiest person that you could meet. So I never could do a coin trick or anything like that. I think I just wanted to, it's sort of fun when I'm, you have to take the fun when you're writing. It's sort of fun to think about how can I misdirect? How can I surprise? What are the ways that I can do this while still being true and organic to the characters where it just doesn't feel like a, a staged trick, but you know, sometimes life throws these left turns at us. And we've seen this again and again this year, just sort of life generally throwing us left turns. Um, you know, I wanted to think about how could, how could I surprise and still entertain and play fair with the reader? So, you know, sometimes I'm quite sure that when I get into trouble when I'm writing is I've written myself into that corner and then I have to figure my way out. And I, that could be by throwing out a chapter and starting again, or sometimes I'm just going to say, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to forge ahead and I'll, I'll figure out a way that feels fair and, and fun, you know, even to the reader. Cause I'm, you know, I'm still at the end of the day, I think one of the reasons we all pick up a crime novel even when it says important things about the world that we live in or the lives that we we live is I want to entertain. And there have been so many domestic thrillers that were like, you know, what would you do to protect your family? This was more like, what do you do when you suspect your family? Which was a lot of fun to do, frankly, so. That's Jeff, a whole favorite line, go ahead. Uh, well, no, I was just gonna say, Jeff, I've been, don't, please no spoilers, I'm about halfway through listening to it on audio and I certainly, um, enjoy getting a physical book as well, but the audio version is terrific because there are all these different voices. You have multi actors in this thing, and it really throws you even more. It's just it's almost uh, like like watching a film. It's just fantastic. Uh, well, it's, you're one of the few authors that I know that that with the audio version has multiple actors doing the uh, doing the book, which is terrific. This is this is something new for me, um, but the the. After the initial discovery of the of the body in the park, it the book centers on the Pollock family, which is a mom, dad, and two teenagers, and um, they tell each chapter not in first person, but each chapter is centered on one of the four of them as the story unfolds. So my publisher called me and said, "We want for the audiobook, we're thinking of doing a cast," 
of uh, and a different reader for each of the family members. And I thought, wow, is that going to be complicated? And then they sent me the the, the 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 samples from the readers, and I was like, oh, this is going to be really cool. I was I'm really excited they decided to do the audiobook this way. Yeah, that's a great look. He's entertaining. And, and that um, brings me to my next question, Jeff, and then I, I want to bring Ethan here too, but uh, which is like, to me as a writer, I don't, you go in their heads, but they each have a secret that you can't reveal to the readers. So it, I couldn't figure out how you were doing it. It felt like, uh, I mean, it felt like such a challenge. You, I mean, again, sleight of, sleight of hand, because you, you're in the head of the person who has you know this knowledge, but you're not giving it to the reader. I mean, how did you how did you do that? I d well, you've just boosted my confidence tremendously. I, I go to my writing session after this and feel so good about myself until I see what I've actually written. But <laughs> um, you know, I think it's always keeping the character focused on the next challenge that they're dealing with, and 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 the secret is sort of pushed in the back, as long as there's a continual challenge or threat to them or to someone that they love. And, and I don't, that doesn't, in this book, because it is in a quiet suburb, it doesn't necessarily mean a physical challenge, it could be an emotional challenge that they're dealing with, especially parents with teenagers or the teenagers keeping things from their parents. Um, I think as long as I keep the story moving, the secret just kind of simmers along until they have to deal with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, it was quite a trick. I have to say oh, it, 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 You're very kind. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so let me, let me bring Ace in here. Um, and I, then we'll talk about the revelators, which sure. is your 10th in the series. And in some ways to me felt like, uh, a reckoning and a culmination. It's the something. It's the story point. The story that you've been building towards for so long, and uh, and I wondered if that felt exciting or kind of pressureful or or both. Well, I think I think what I want to do with this book is there. Everything has been kind of linked up in the earlier novels. Is you know they are self-contained stories, but there are these long story arcs that have started from the very first book ten years ago from the Ranger up to three four books ago, and we see everything you know, when is the payoff going to happen? You know, it's like, I've got a bunch of cliffhangers, a bunch of cliffhangers, and we need to finally have something come to head. So the goal of this book, um, and it wasn't, you know, it's it's not going to be the case, but I, I wrote it as if this was, this was going to be the last book in the series. And I think everybody should write like that. I think everybody should write, this is the last book I'm ever going to write. You know, I heard, I can't remember who said it, a writer said years ago, so never hold material back, never hold something back to your next book, give it all that you can. And so that's what the Revelators was, was just like, this is going to be the finale of the, you know, if it was a TV series, the finale of the TV series, this is everything coming to a head. Uh, but of course, I like making money. <laughs> I like to feed my family. And so there, there will be a book 11. But I think for people that have been uh, reading for years, I think this hopefully will be a, a big payoff for them. Well, and it, it felt, I mean, you didn't time it this way, but the book has always felt very timely and resonant, and I think never more so than with this book, too, because all this sort of, um, you know, c corruption and the sort of infiltration of the sort of criminal world and the government world and big business has sort of, um, has sort of come to this head at a moment when our sort of awareness of the of the, the far dark end of um, forces beyond our control making decisions for us and exploiting us is, has never felt greater. So does the timing of it feel oddly weird too? Well, I think 10 years ago when I first started the series is I thought that, you know, maybe some of the villains were a little bit stylized, a little bit too, you know, as far as in the black and white category, as far as who they were. Um, you know, I had guys that were in this racist militia group when Quinn first came home and the Ranger and, and our mutual uh, great friend Jack Pendarvis pointed this out. He said in the very beginning of the series, these guys were hanging out in the woods and being secretive and running their maneuvers and keeping this thing kind of a, a secret society. Now these people are marching on the town squares down south and, and elsewhere. And I think that's where we are. And I think that corruption, um, you know, that may have seemed very blatant or hypocrisy that may have been very blatant in the earlier books now seems very true to life. And so, you know, I was looking, and I'll tell you how, you know, how uh, exact it is, 
is I work here in Oxford, Mississippi. I work on, a town, on the town square. I'm looking right now outside my window. And I could see outside two weeks ago, guys in military fatigues surrounding a Confederate statue holding AK-47s. Now that's something that I would have thought was just wacky 10 years ago. I would have never thought that. I thought that that would be too far to go. So yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think these times are, um, the, the issues in the books that I've been talking about seem more timely than ever. And I think that's too why it feels, I mean, you, you dedicated the book to Charles Portis, a writer who I know we both love. And it, it, there's something about your books that remind me of him and in part it's the humor, but in part it's the view of, of human nature that, that our weaknesses define us in large part, but so does our resilience. And your good characters are so, um, they feel like, I feel like myself clinging to them more than ever in this book. Uh, Lily is a special favorite mm -hmm. of mine. Uh, and there is something so satisfying about having uh, goodness in, in, the, in this world. Is that, is that important to you to have that, um, to have that element of hope and, and uh, um, human connection? I think so. I think that maybe in real life, I may be more jaded than my, my books represent. I think anyone like with Portis or for me, spending time in the newsroom, you certainly develop a certain kind of gallows humor where you kind of have to you know, either laugh at these people as far as the bad guys or you'll go nuts. But I do have, uh, the books are a little bit ho more hopeful maybe than I am as a, as a person, but there are characters who I think that do believe that things will work out and that, that actual goodness will win out. So somebody like Quinn is, I think somewhat of a kind of a square character that he really does believe in things like truth, justice and the American way. And when I say that, I don't mean people who hug flags and you know false patriotism. He really believes in the, ide the ideal, uh, e idealized version of what America could be. And I think that's what these books represent in the same way his sister, uh, who's actually his sister, unlike you guys that um, <laughs> this all the time. For you to sell books or whatever that's all about, but for, for but she's actually living the life of what I'd say like somebody who lives a faith based life. She's actually out there helping people. She's helping people of color. She's out there helping, trying to make her community a better place. And she's not just wearing the t-shirt. So yeah, I think the books are are um, hopefully have a glimmer of hope in the sea of of decadence that we find ourselves in 2020. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, uh, there was a question that popped up for, for you, Ace. Um, if you ever thought about taking Quinn on the road? Wow. I, you know, people have asked me that, you know, the only place I would love to see Quinn go is maybe Los Angeles, because his father um, is, a, is an ex-stunt man who spends a lot of time in LA. He's kind of AWOL. So I'd kind of like to do a you know, kind of a Coogan's Bluff story where you've got like a guy from Mississippi. I don't think Quinn is like a rube that he would be like, oh my God, LA, I don't know what to do, you know? But I think it would be kind of an interesting mashup of cultures. So, so maybe one day. And the thing I was gonna add too, talking about the different settings is, you know, I think one thing that Jeff and I, and, and you too, Megan, is we tend to take on um, smaller worlds for bigger themes. And I think that's really um, where I find my most, most of my interest. So, you know, I take on a small town in Mississippi and Jericho and you guys often uh, attack the suburbs and I find the suburbs maybe, you know, maybe even more twisted <laughs> in a dark place. I mean, maybe. you know, I, I live in Mississippi now and I have for many years and I lived in Alabama for many years, but I also, you know, moved around a lot and I lived in a lot of suburbs and there's some dark twisted stuff that happens in those coves. And, uh, Yes, as we see in, in Jeff's book. Um, yeah. I, I want one more question for you, um, Ace, and then I want to start asking you both um, some questions. But I really have always thought of your series as not a, a Quinn Colson series exactly, but um, it's really a series about uh, a place and its people, uh, you know, it, it, they really dominate. And you said something the other night um, that um, one of your inspirations being Deadwood and you want to do a Southern Deadwood and that so locked into place for me because I do think that that, that that show's notion of morality too is very close to, it has a very gimlet eyed view, but also um, does believe in a certain kind of goodness and grace. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about, a little bit about how that, had, that did influence you. Well, you know, two things really influenced me a lot. Of course, being here in Oxford, Mississippi, this sounds pretentious, but I don't mean this pretentious at all. It's just is in the air here. You've spent a great deal amount of time in, in Oxford, Mississippi, and you can't be helped 
but being influenced by Faulkner. And I think David Milch was too. I think Milch also was taking on a community or, you know, you could say like what Steinbeck used to say about, you know, with Cannery Row or it'd be his own title pool that he could play with the characters. So yeah, I mean, things think, you know, with, with Faulkner, with Yakima, Patapa County, but also with what Milch did with Deadwood, where you see, you know, the literal rise of the town, you see the town being erected and being, you know, plotted off. And then you see all the different ways it can go and the political alliances. And, and I mean, somebody, a character like my, my queen pen to steal character from you, Madam uh, Fanny Hathcock certainly has a lot of inspiration, uh, you know, from, uh, from Swearingen, you know, I have a lot of that Swearingen. And then and I know Milch had a lot of, it all goes around, you know, Milch goes back to, uh, to Johnny Guitar and found a lot of influence for Swearingen and Johnny Guitar. So anyway, those, all those things come into place. And uh, I'm just a pop culture um, uh, person that loves, loves pop culture aficionado. And it, that's, that's where all this stuff comes about. Well, I see that uh, Brian says it's a shame that Ace forgot to shave before this event. <laughs> but he wants to know what we are all drinking. <laughs> so um, I have, well, more important than my drink is, is my cozy, which is Vienna's place, um, which I think, can people still get these cozies? Uh, these yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you, can, you can get those, I don't know, on, you can get them on my website. Uh, but yeah, now if you're, uh, it's, if you want to add, you know, you, people that you, they'll either think you're very literary and love books by recognize it, or that you're in a, you, you love strip clubs. So either way, it's a, it's a win-win situation. Yeah. Good so for family I think, fun. I think Jeff is being good, right? You are, you are not. I have, yeah. I have some, I have some green tea. Uh, I was going to say, speaking of Deadwood, speaking of HBO series. Yes. Congratulations on your news that was in Variety this week? Well, I was very, uh, very excited that, that the news got released. Uh, we've known it for some time and I know Megan's known about it for some time and, and uh, it's nice to finally see it in print. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to click on variety.com and see something going on. So I'm excited about that happening for sure. So that is the perfect, that was gonna be my lead into the next question, which is I just wondered, I mean, we all, to a certain extent, I identify this too as a Midwesterner, but I think more than ever, maybe for both of you, um, what do you think that writers or reviewers or publishers or Hollywood gets right or wrong about the South or Texas? Because uh, they, I, I think just having spent time in both places, it's often a lot. And I wondered if, if, you, if you think about that a bit, uh, Jeff, do you wanna can talk about the Texas side of it? Well, I, I, you know, I don't wanna pick on anyone's television show or, or creation, but I'll just say there was recently a show set in Austin that was got everything so incredibly wrong. I think people thought it was a parody. And, you know, it, it wasn't Friday Night Lights. It was another show that wasn't on for very long. But it was like, literally, it's like, okay, you don't, you, you know, they think we're in a desert. They think, uh, every, you know, people are, everyone has a horse or an oil well. And, you know, I, I just- you have, you have a horse and an oil well. I've been to you, I know that. Yeah. You, but not everyone does though, Ace. Um, you know? I'm like a Ewing, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, but, the last book signing we had a person, you rode up on the horse in Houston yeah. and you got all the way from Austin. So of course, of course I did. You know, I mean, Austin is now the 11th largest city in the country, and it has been utterly transformed by venture capital and software companies. We have like 12,000, we're gonna have 12,000 people working here for Apple. You know, uh, the, the city has gone from this sleepy, hippie-ish um, uh, uh, town to feeling like this new leader in the new economy right now. And so I, I often think, but Austin is still a very Southern city in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, uh, I feel like it is changing what it means to be a Southern city you know, the way sort of that Atlanta has changed it you know, uh, or Nashville. And I just feel like people, people still have a lot of old assumptions and perceptions that don't necessarily apply as, as strongly as what they used to. I think that's we had a, get wrong. Jeff, we had a TV series that came in and um, 
it was called, uh, I'll just name it, it was called Memphis Beat or something like that. And it was every cliche about Memphis that you could imagine. And what was even worse about it, they shot it in New Orleans. So they shot the damn show in New Orleans. So, I mean, New, there's nowhere in the world that looks like New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans, New Orleans you know, has the Spanish moths and, uh, you know, and they just, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. It just all seems to be the same place. And uh, one of the things is I do love watching shows that capture the feel of a real area, which is kind of a rare thing. I, I remember, you know, it's so economic. I remember with, with Dare Me, when we were choosing a location, we had a lot of pressure to shoot it in Atlanta. It's supposed to be the Rust Belt. And Atlanta, it does not, I mean, in the South, even like the way towns are structured is different. You all have squares. We don't have a square. You know, like everything, the trees are so different. The, another place that had been recommended was Baton Rouge. Like Baton Rouge, that, I mean, that does not look like Detroit, you know? So it is, It is. you know, so much of it is, is economics. I think that plays into it. But then that perpetuates these various fantasies that in this moment where, you know, we're trying to sort of, where the nation is in some ways divided in many ways, I think sometimes these are sort of dangerous stereotypes can really do far more harm. Well, that's, um, that's the thing that I hope um, with, the, you know, uh, with, with a show about Quinn Colson is I hope they get the, the area correct because it is rare to see something just about what I'd say middle America, whether it's the deep South or the Midwest or whatever being portrayed accurately. Uh, you know, it's like, I think we were talking again with Jack, you know, when they shot Close Encounters uh, of a third kind, it was supposed to be Indiana. And, you know, they shot it in Mobile, Alabama. And it definitely looks like Mobile, Alabama. Just, um, so when you were doing Dare Me, when, when came the point where the rust belt and the setting got to be important because I don't remember it being such a big deal in the book. It seemed more of a broad idea where, where the- uh... Uh, Yeah, so that was when, you know, when you move to series, um, you have a bigger world and, um, um, and really, you know, my books are closer, Jeff, to your, to what you have with Never Ask Me and, and many of your books where they're very insular and they take place for a very short amount of time. But of course, a TV series needs to live and long. And and so the, the, the stuff I have in my head that I don't put in the book, which is that everything is <laughs> that where I am, um, uh, move forward. And I really wanted it to be about the Rust Belt because there's never any, the last show that was, I think, legitimately supposed to be set in a Rust Belt that resembled it was Roseanne, the original Roseanne in the 80s. That's how rare you see these towns sort of decimated by the collapse of the auto industry and manufacturing. These once great, these great, once great, you know, beacons of uh, prosperity, you know, and, uh, you know, that the were once the Austin, you know, Detroit was once Austin, and Detroit will be again, but uh, you know, speechifying. Um, but I, that makes me think, like, and this the question relates to this that's come up is, you know, we are all getting such a media diet right now. And I wondered if you could recommend for everyone out there something that you read or watched or listened to that might be a sort of respite from the darkness around us. <laughs> I would say dare me, but I don't think that's a respite from the darkness. <laughs> that's, a, that's a journey into the darkness. Um, yes, yes. But I would say, isn't, isn't dare me now available on, on uh, Netflix? Can't you watch the whole? In the U.S. Netflix, this will be a couple months, but uh, yeah. it's still available on USA. For on USA, it's a stream. So highly, highly recommended for Twisted Dark Fun. Yeah. Uh, not for the kids. No, nope. nope. But uh, it's terrific. Jeff? Uh, well, I'll recommend something for the kids because my kids got me into it. Um, and it was amazing when it came back on to Netflix a few weeks ago, it became the number one show on Netflix, which is Avatar The Last Airbender, mm -hmm. uh, which was originally you know, an, a an animated series that was on Nickelodeon several years ago. And my son said, dad, this series is really good. Watch it with us. And I was like, I don't want to watch this thing on Nickelodeon. And it's so well written and it's so thoughtful and the character development in it, I would just go, how, how did they manage to, to do this in sort of this interesting fantasy world? And it's incredibly well done. Yeah, and it, are I, you talking about the, the animated series or is there a live action? The animated series. Then I there was a live action movie that was not, that was not, was not well received. 
and now Netflix is going to make a live action new series of it. I but, just recently uh, watched the M. Night Shyamalan film and it's, I thought it was great. I enjoyed it. I thought it was terrific. It's a lovely well, film. I, I would say when, when, when it came back on Netflix, my youngest son binged it and watched it in about a two, three day period, just solid all the way through. And I wish I'd had the time to join him to watch it again, because it is really, really well done. And it's, and it's and appropriate for the whole family. So there you go. I, I'll add two things to Jeremy really quickly. Uh, one thing that's as far as, you know, getting out of the darkness of the times, uh, we've been, I've been watching with my kids Lost in Space, the Net, Netflix TV show the first two, two seasons. I love, I love the, the original. They were, I couldn't wait to get home every day when it was um, in syndication back in the 70s. And I watched, I just loved it. And the new show is amazing. I, I heard that they've shortened the, the last season and because of COVID, they, you know, I'm not even sure they're gonna have one, but it's a terrific show. And I've been watching that. And then of course, every night my go-to one is, I think every season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> that's about the only thing that's been really helping me get through uh, uh, you know this this whole 2020 thing well i want to second the endorsement of dare me uh, uh, for megan just because you think about how difficult it is to expand that a novel into that world and i thought it was all just as everything megan is involved with masterfully done but I also watch, I've seen the first season of Lost in Space. Used to love watching it at home, the original at home after school. We had a double feature of it, Land of the Giants, I'm, I recall as a child. Um, and yeah, it is, it, and Parker Posey is Dr. Smith. I mean, I, thought was just, thought. I love Parker Posey and everything oh, she does. When I heard about that casting, I just started laughing immediately. I was like, <laughs> who's going to be Dr. Smith? And I did the last in the film, it was Gary Oldman, and I was like, "Who could be Doctor Smith? Like Parker Posey, perfect casting." Oh, God, <laughs> an obvious choice. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that show too so much as a kid, and the you know watching it in reruns as I'm sure you both did, and it the, already the black and white ones and the ones in color, and the, it felt like it always it was never in sequence either. They would just throw on. This is what's so different about. For, for your kids, right, their experience of story is so changed because we yeah. had so few choices and they have so many. Um, do you, you know, I mean, do you ever think about that now as writers about, um, you know, attention, how hard it is to hold it and keep it in, in this sort of ADD environment? So, what do you think, I, can I, oh, no, you go ahead. No, 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 please. No, no, you go. No, so my youngest son and I have been watching Akira Kurosawa films together. And last weekend, we watched The Seven Samurai. And he, and he said at one point, he goes, I feel I've seen some of these tropes before. And I said, <laughs> but, I said and he said, but I understand, Dad, this was the movie that started it all. He said, but it's different for me having seen all these other movies that have been inspired or have drawn on Seven Samurai, which has been hugely influential, to go back to the source material and see it. And so then last night we watched Yojimbo, which mm -hmm. most Americans know is a fistful of dollars, you know, with, with Clint Eastwood. But Yojimbo was the original and he's like, he's like, yeah, I can see how this has influenced a lot of Westerns and other action films. So it's interesting to me to watch things with him as, a, as an 18 year old going back to material that was the original, and yes. when you're talking about story, how, and I'm getting to see all these great movies again too, which is what I'm really loving. Boy, Yojimbo, what a fantastic film. And you watch Fistful of Dollars, and I think there was a lawsuit at one time. It's almost shot for shot for uh, Yojimbo, isn't it? And it yeah. doesn't get any better than Toshiro Mifune. I mean, he's yeah. maybe the greatest, the greatest actor, period, anywhere. Well, and Kurosawa did steal from Dashiell Hammett, but you know, so, so I think it's all, yeah, there's no stealing, there's no stealing of the arts, I suppose. <laughs> he did. It's all, it's all, you know, that's why I love pop culture. I mean, it's all the same, you know, it's, it's Kurosawa watching John Ford and then giving it back and, and, and watching it in, in samurai films. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful, it's that give and take of pop culture. Which is well, you both infused these books with it. I, I mean, Jeff, you have the game, which, uh, and, and various elements of technology and the, and the way that apps function. And then Ace, you, uh, one of the things I always love about your books is 
he was so light with it, but uh, a song, a lyric that we might know, um, this sort of little detail, some, you know, something playing in the background. And do you ever think about like, I remember hearing an editor once saying to me very early on that, that you should never reference a, a song because then if the reader doesn't know it, they're confused or they feel shut out. And I never thought that was true, but, but it does require like a touch. Uh, so how, do you, how do you take that on? Boy, I'm glad that wasn't my editor <laughs> because I'd be screwed because every, every chapter is littered with, with references. Of course, uh, you know, I've been very influenced by, uh, by Elmore Leonard and Robert B. Parker. And they would always throw out pop culture references of film and old songs, or whatever. And I, you know, I maybe didn't know what they were talking about, but you could, you kind of knew, you kind of knew what it was. And nowadays, with Google, there's no reason you can't put that stuff in. In fact, there was a entire Spencer book that was published in the UK about his obscure references that Parker put in for old, you know, movies and jazz songs and that kind of stuff. So. I put it in there and if people get it, they love it. If they don't, then they'll just move on. Well, I think so too, but you uh, uh, always careful to avoid too many lyrics because then you have to pay a lot of money. <laughs> well, I have, Jeff, if you have had to deal with that because dealing with song lyrics is a massive, massive pain. I had to, my, my first, first book, but I'd never do it again. You no, know, I did it the first two books and one of the, the lyrics that I wanted to, to use, um, you know, really meant a lot to the book. The, the publisher wanted $8,000. And I was like, okay, I'm not doing this ever again. I'm good. I made the mistake and then I took it out. So it's not in there. I'm trying to quote an Oasis song, which is, you know, once a very, very big band, but it's their publisher that's the, the doozy. It's like Sony Music would like $45,000 for you to have one, you know, one extra line from it. So I yeah, always start high. I went from one, one publisher wanted $5,000 per lyric. And then by the end, um, I got the deal for 25 bucks. So they started very high. Yeah, bargain. You got a bargain. Well, yeah. They, they yeah, not the say that the mom and Iris and never asked me as a so songwriter. And we established eventually in the book, not a spoiler, but when, when she, they keep 90s on nine on their car, begin, her kids call that mom radio. And you think initially it's because just her favorite station. And then we find out she wrote songs for NSYNC and for Britney Spears. And I just thought that would be fun as anything, but I'd be careful not to reference any NSYNC or Britney Spears songs or lyrics in that, or make it sound like she'd written those. I just said, I just made up the song titles that she had done for them. But yeah, that's that part I'm going to get. That part in your book made me feel very old when I realized that <laughs> Britney Spears was now mom radio when she was sitting in the car. I was like, boy, this is- The 90s are yeah. back in this part. Yeah. Back. Yeah. And, and I don't know why that made me feel old. I wasn't really listening to that stuff in the, the 90s. It would have been more my station. You, you missed out. You missed out. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Um, so I thought we would sort of round it down by maybe we could talk about because we all want to be in bookstores right now and we can we're all book lovers um if we might you might want to tell me an experience at murder by the book uh that or another indie bookstore uh that um makes you makes you feel nostalgic um for for that moment when we can sort of freely freely browse and, and lose ourselves in a store for, uh, you know, with mask if necessary, but uh, uh, memories. I think I have two about Murder by the Book. The first one is I had my very first book signing there in 1994 and my editor called the store to see how it was going. And Martha, who was the owner of the store at the time, told him it was going great. And I think she would have said that even if no one had been there. But um, I went to Rice, which isn't that far from Murder by the Book. So I had a lot of local support, which was really nice. And then also when the store had its, I don't know, maybe 25th anniversary, or they had a big dinner. I was lucky enough to be one of the authors they asked to come speak in honor of the store's anniversary. And I made the point then that it was so much more than a bookstore. It is a cultural force in one of America's great cities. You cannot underestimate the importance of Murder by the Book in terms of what it's meant to the mystery community and what it's meant to Houston. Um, and also they had a picture of there, I think from that first signing and I was an infant, I was a baby. I don't look like that anymore. They need to take that picture down. John and McKenna probably know which one I mean, but oh. 
you know, one of the, the things that always, when I, when I come to Murder Write the Book, what I hate is that I never have time to browse that much. And I get into the store and it's like, you know, it's like a wine store. It's like a fine wine store or fine, fine food store with this great curated collection. And it's everything that I love, you know, and it's not just modern books. It's going back to, to Hammett and Chandler and these wonderful editions and great new trade paperbacks and whatever. But um, it's always a highlight of my tour. And I mean, I've been doing this now for God knows 20 plus years and every single book they have looked out for me and they have supported every book from the very first novel when I I think my first novel maybe printed a hundred copies or something like that and they were out hand selling it and then of course just the personal connection that we have to uh to McKenna and to John and, and the whole crew there um you know just on a personal level I appreciate what they do on a business side but I think I look forward to going there just because we always go out for a great dinner afterwards. Uh, McKenna and I end up going to go see a movie and it's just a, it's a, it's an annual tradition. And I really miss that this year. I really do. But of That's course, right. McKenna, I know what you're going to say is I'm usually so tired on book tour. By the time we see a movie, I always fall asleep halfway through. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And John just put in the comments, Megan is here to make us cry. You know, we miss seeing everyone too. So uh, these moments and memories are, are uh, definitely dear to us also, and I'm not going to get choked up, but we are missing seeing everyone. Ace, I don't know what terrible movie we would go see and halfway fall asleep in, but um, <laughs> it's always an adventure. <laughs> yeah, it may have a little something to do with the drinking beforehand, too. I'm not going to say that. It could. It could for sure. Um, so we do have some questions from the comments. Um, Megan has done a fabulous job incorporating some of them, but I am going to ask... Um, Blue asks, uh, what do you think are some shows that get it right as portraying the South, in portraying the South? Wow, that's tough. Uh, shows that get it right. I know it's going to come to me later, but, um, you know, I haven't seen it yet, but there's a show on Stars right now called P Valley. And I, I haven't watched it, but the little bit of clips that I've seen about it in the reviews, it's, a, it's about a a strip club in the Mississippi Delta. And I thought this is gonna be really far-fetched because usually people don't get the Delta correct. The Delta is a very specific place, but the parts I've seen of it seem spot on. Um, you know, as far as, uh, God, I can't even think of, you know, the Andy Griffith show, <laughs> I think maybe is accurate. You know, I don't know. Megan, how about you? Can you think of anyone? Atlanta feels true to, I don't, I've never lived in Atlanta, but Atlanta feels very true to place to me. Um, yeah. Is it's it's devoted to that. I think you have to have that right. The creator that is like standing by there. That this is a place that means something to them, and they stand by. Maybe. I mean, I, I kind of Jeff and I, you, you and I have talked about this before. Of course, I think you know it's like the old commercial. You know, Texas is its own country. Um, you know, but then again, people really lump, lump Texas into being the South as well. But I thought the Happen Leonard show was fantastic. I don't know if anyone saw that but from Joe Lansdale, but I thought it really captured Texas very well um, as far as that particular section of Texas. No, I think that's a great example. I do feel like Friday Night Lights really captured the importance of, of high school football, which you know we won't have this fall probably. Um, and, and my son's school won the state championship in football in, 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 last, in uh, the, uh, the, the last season here earlier this year in January and uh, but that yeah I feel like Friday Night Lights always sort of captured that that energy um, about that it's yeah. hard because uh, in Atlanta I also agree Megan is a great example um, it's hard because you you sometimes feel like they they say let's set a show in the south and that's like the spark of how they decide to do this and it's not necessarily drawing on someone's background or it's just like okay the south is you know is is hot now or you know i don't know i mean mo most shows well, about yeah, that. No. <laughs> yeah. well most of the shows Very about accurate of georgia <laughs> yeah most of the shows about the south are really god awful they let's face it they really are terrible um you know even, even a show like justified you know i don't again i think kentucky is different from the south like texas is different from the south but um, you know that show obviously was shot in California and had a lot of larger than life kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so another question. This one's from me, but I've been doing them for a lot of these events, and um, I like this question, so I'm going to say it again. I stole it from comments a few weeks ago. So P.D. James once said there were only four mur motives for murder: love, lust, loathing, or lucre. What's your favorite motive? 
and Megan, feel free to chime in on this. Oh, Megan has them all covered in Dare Me. Yes. That's all. I mean, I'm trying to think anything. Is there, is there anything not covered in Dare Me? I, ever, I don't think it's ever really. Well, I know it's true. I, 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 yeah, I do. Those were, yeah. <laughs> they all landed. <laughs> one nuts on the other. Check, check. <laughs> I think I don't have a cooker, but I actually I do in my next next book. So, um, yeah. I thought Go back I over the list again. Oh, go ahead. Uh, the list is love, lust, loathing, and lucre. Mm. Great. Yeah. What else is there? Come on. <laughs> secrets. So some of, we've had people volunteer secrets, like uncovered secrets, but that could tie in. There are secrets about love, lust. Oh, love exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The nice, nice way to get around it, but let's, yeah, it's yeah. so primal. Those are those are such a primal drives. I mean, um, jealousy, but that's usually connected to love or love oh. or sometimes looper. <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question, which is from the comments. Um, what is everyone working on now or releasing next? And then what are your favorite um, books or writers that you would recommend to readers? Hmm. Yeah, start. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go really quickly. Uh, book for writers, easily. Elmore Leonard's top ten rules. Every writer should should have that. Uh, what I'm working on is I'm in the back half right now of the new Spencer novel, and that will be out in November. I'm working on an, the next Lake Haven standalone, um, which actually takes place more in downtown Austin than just in Lake Haven, um, and it is about two women who are suddenly widowed and find themselves having to try to solve their husband's murders together. Um, and it's due at the end of the month and it should be out next month. And I don't <laughs> And then um, for a book for writers, uh, Plotting and Writing Suspense Fiction by Patricia Highsmith, which is a short read and I think actually valuable even if you're not writing suspense fiction. It's it's really interesting insights into her process and just sort of uh, one of the one of the books one of the chapters talks about how a book was turning into a failure and how she saved it and turned it around which i think is really applicable to every single writer ever no matter what they're working on <laughs> megan uh yes um i ha i have a book coming out next year uh <laughs> next june it's called the turnout uh and um oh i it's a quarantine uh, manuscript completion, <laughs> um, and uh, very glad to have turned that in. Um, and the, I never recommend books about how to write just because they never were useful to me. Uh, but I, what I say is just read very widely. Do not be narrow. Um, and you, you know, let's say, oh, I want to write like a bestseller. Like, and that's not really, you know, there's no formula for any of that. Um, and so just, just read widely. Um, and, um, but that's what worked for me. I know other people um, feel otherwise. And what about recommendations just for a, a reader? Just who are some of your favorite authors to read? Uh, you all notwithstanding. Do you want me to start? Uh, sure. Start, uh, you know, for me, um, God, I, I do read all over the place. I'm a sucker for, uh, obviously, crime fiction, westerns, uh, Southern lit, you know, so everything from Flannery O'Connor to Dashiell Hammett to Elmore Leonard, uh, you know, Ch uh, Raymond Chandler, you know, uh, you know, Robert Parker definitely changed my life. Uh, John D. McDonald, list goes on and on and on. And of course, big fan of these two as well. Definitely. Absolutely. This is, uh, I feel like I've been hanging out with Jeff because I've been, the only thing I can do is go for long walks. And I've been listening to the, the dysfunction of the suburbs on my headphones <laughs> going to these walks. And uh, anyway, we, go, we can go on and on from there. Yeah. Um, I've been rereading lately, and two of my favorites that I've been rereading are, speaking of Southern lit, Eudora Welty, whose short stories I just really, really, really love and started reading in college. Um, and then lately, I've been rereading Josephine Tay, um, the, the British mystery writer who sort of did a different book every time she wrote a book. She didn't write that many. But I, I'm, right now I'm rereading Brat Farrar, which is about a family riven with suspicions uh, when a, a, a guy claiming to be a long lost family member shows up. 
And it's just so, I think I have a, I read her originally back in the twenties. I think I appreciate her more reading her now. It's like, I have a better just appreciation for the craftsmanship and the storytelling um, in, in her novels. And also a big fan of these two. I know, always have to, you have say. to say. You have to say that, Jeff. Come I have on. to say that. You have to say it. But it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts because it's true. <laughs> well, I don't like these two at all, but I, <laughs> it's <laughs> obvious. Um, but uh, I, um, I would one I would recommend that maybe not everyone who reads a lot of crime fiction has come upon and and uh, would be Chester Himes who wrote in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Most of his books are back in print. They are incredible. The Coffin Ed and Grave Digger Jones series, which is set in Harlem, in the would feel unbelievably resonant now. Um, I just pulled one of them out the other day because it it's really they were written at a moment when of course racial divide was very intense. And he's a fascinating expat writer who moved from, moved to Paris and just is great and really lively and uh, funny and just such a such a treasure. Yeah, I was glad that those are back in print. We've been recommending them widely. And um, if you haven't tried Josephine Tay, Daughter of Time is especially timely for those of us stuck at home because it's about someone stuck at home recuperating and solving a mystery. So at the very beginning of all this in March, we did a feature on it and Laura Lippmann's Girl in the Green Raincoat, which both have at-home detectives um, unable to leave and solving cases. So those have been kind of fun during this whole thing. Um, I'm going to wrap this up with a few questions for all of you. Oh, there you go. Jeff's got it. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap this up with a few questions for all of you from the Proust questionnaire because I enjoy getting to know people better. Um, so we're going to just uh, in the order of my screen, it's going to go Jeff, Megan, Ace, okay, just so it's not awkward. Um, what is your favorite prize possession that is, I always qualify this with, it needs to be inanimate, not your family or your pets. Jeff. Uh, a friend built me a standing desk after we lost everything in the fire. He's a master craftsman in Seattle, and he assembled it and sent me a video to put it all together so I have a place to stand and work and I've just treasured it every day. Megan. Oh my gosh. Oh, I guess my, my Edgar. I really <laughs> do love it. I, I can put it, bring it on camera, but uh, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is big for me, especially because I feel like he's looking over my shoulder, <laughs> keeping me honest. Ace. I, I think I, it sounds like a, a kind of a, a nerd answer, but I, I collect these vintage movie posters and I really love my movie poster collection. I don't know if you can see this right behind me, but there's a there's an original movie poster for the Wild Bunch that's right there. And it's it's an original from the from the theater. And so those are kind of my prized possessions. I have movie uh, posters going back to the 1940s and, and uh, 1950s. And I, I love that stuff. So those were probably as far as uh, you know, objects and things that we own, those that's probably what I, that and, and first edition books what I really treasure. All right, the next one will go in reverse order. So it's only fair, people have time to think uh, different amounts. So Ace, you'll get this one first. Um, what is the trait you most admire in a person? What's the trait? Um, boy, <laughs> I'd like to think of something funny right now, but it's, it's the middle of the day, I can't. I'll go with, <laughs> let's go, let's make, Let's say uh, loyalty. Yep. Megan? I would say um, a healthy dose of weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? I'll say kindness, and I mean genuine kindness, not the fake kindness a lot of people throw out in the world, but genuine kindness. Jeff, did I tell you how great, great you look today? You just look, you know, amazing. Uh, the shirt at uh, the glass, I just I want to tell you Thank how you look great. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, before I get to my last Proust question and wrap everything up, I'm going to do a little housekeeping. So once again, we have copies of The Revelators, which is the 10th and Coulson book, highly, highly recommended. Also, Jeff's latest book, Never Ask Me, also highly, highly recommended. And we always have Megan's books in stock. Her most recent was Give Me Your Hand, but you can't go wrong with any of her books. We um, adore Megan at Murder by the Book. We have signed book plates for these. We have um, Quinn Colson for Sheriff bumper stickers as well. 
Um, we also did something new today in the comments. We put in a virtual tip jar. So if you already do have the books um, or you are not in a position to buy a new hardcover today, but you're enjoying our events and you want to buy us a cup of coffee, we would love that. Um, it lets us know that you are appreciating these um, and the effort that goes into them. We love that you're watching them and enjoying them. And it's just another way for uh, you to support the store during a, a tough time. So please consider that. If not, no big deal. It's just out there if you want to. Um, so to wrap up today, final question is, what is your idea of perfect happiness? And it's only fair that Megan has to start this one. Oh, well, now it's on my mind because he's put it there, but a gimlet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true though. <laughs> a good gimlet. Yes, a good gimlet in the Chandler uh, spirit. Excellent. Who's next? Yeah. I'll, I'll say time with my family. No. <laughs> oh, Jeff, that's a family. <laughs> our, both the boys are going to be off in college, and it's just an adjustment. So we're about to be empty nesters. So Gimlet's help. <laughs> Gimlet's help. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Ace? I think a, a nice, I think right now as we're sitting here and, you know, I don't know how hot it is right now in, in Houston, but it's pretty hot. hot uh it's a nice cool movie theater in the in the afternoon to be able to sit in a nice cool movie theater and and watch something new or something old i really miss that but that's that's great happiness and calm for me and get and get a nap clearly it's calming because it and makes it, you push nice. you to sleep <laughs> i didn't fall asleep through any of the good i didn't fall asleep in midsummer i did it not. was way too weird to fall asleep <laughs> I didn't do that. no you scarred oh. me for life i still wake up in the middle of the night going damn it mckenna <laughs> the bear. Somewhere. I, I never get over that. I'm in therapy because of that. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I am so glad that we all got to chat today. I miss seeing all of you, and this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank everyone for watching. We're still closed at the store for in person browsing, but we're doing mail orders and recommending over the phone and contact us for a pickup. And we would love if you reach out to us for some great books. So um, have a wonderful afternoon, and bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Megan. Thank you.